three, two, one. It should be live. It says it's recording, says it's streaming. Hello, Twitch. Um, <laughs> hello, students in Norway. Um, how are you guys going? So, right. I'm the broadcaster. Great. So, um, so in, in today's lecture, um, in today's topic, I was going to talk about networking multiplayer and organize for net next week to have another group by group meeting with you all um, to catch up with the progress on the projects and how you're going and to refine some of those um, assessment criteria to make sure that everything is is like you kind of have a have a sense of where you're trying to get to and see how we're progressing um, with the game development so um, the, the plan today is to talk about some of the networking and multiplayer aspects of games um, because this was one of the things that you guys voted as being important. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting to discuss when we move beyond single player games and just creating a game that engages a single player, what some of the aspects of multiplayer gaming are and, and, and kind of why that's exciting and interesting and, and also some of the technology. Uh, now, many of you will have done network cloud courses and cloud courses and those sort of things so for some of you this is going to be just a, a, a recap of some of that um, but for some of you it will be um, it might be new-ish um, do tell me if you're kind of being bored and I'll move faster and if you're understanding then then, then that, that's all fine okay so um, so I'm going to talk about the reasons for networking multiplayer and then we're going to go through some some um, some of the networking stuff right so it's kind of a mix of of motivation for creating multiplayer games as well as some technology that we use to to implement those um would it be possible to start the stream a couple of minutes before you start talking ah actually that's yeah no that's that's a good point i should i should really say um hi and do a bit more sort of you know warming up the crowd before i jump into actually talking about the topic um so that it kind of pops up you see the notification and you can click on it so yep no good point sorry about that um <laughs> the recording will still have that bit in it where i kind of warm up the crowd um but you know that's that's that that should be fine um so yeah um as i said i'm i'm going to be talking about networking today um and multiplayer and come some of the justifications for it. Uh, now this was was um, in the if we're looking at the the course we had um, I've I've uploaded the the notes to the the course uh, and if we have a look at the um, boards and the issues um, the course multiplayer and networking. Right, so that's that's the the one that we're doing now. So it's to be done. So when we finish, we'll put it into into done. And I and so next week I'm thinking of GPU shaders because that looked like it had the next highest votes um, after this networking one. Okay, so we'll we'll do it that way. Okay. So um, as I said, we're going to look at at um, the the reasons for multiplayer uh, and then talk about some of the tools that we use to do multiplayer gaming. Um, so hopefully most people have joined now and are just starting to come in. We're a couple of minutes in. Um, I, I, can, I can start with, with doing the whole, you know, it's been, we're, we're decreasing our, our lockdown here in New Zealand. So we're, we're not quite as, as, um, we've not, we've got, uh, one community transmission today and one in, on the border. So we're doing all right. Um, it looks like we're coming into summer and, and if we keep, where we are, um, we'll have uh, potentially no community transmission, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're going to keep our borders closed for a bunch longer, um, so people can't come in. Uh, though we are starting to look at, at sports, so um, allowing some sports teams to come into into New Zealand. Um, the uh, we have a, a COVID tracing app, so um, a mobile phone app um, that we all use, um, which looks like oh it's trying to scan um dashboard yeah covid tracing app you can't see any of that okay yep so it's a covid tracing app um that's the one that we use uh here in new zealand um uh, and uh, actually it's one of the nice things i've been i've been working with them around gamification and how we use games to engage people with doing that contact tracing 
and um, you know there's lots of discussions on to to help with the contact tracing do you give incentives and those sort of things so so we're having some interesting discussions around engaging people with activities that will help with COVID um, tracing uh, and can we create games that help people understand more about um, the spread of viruses and contact tracing and wearing masks and so so actually we're looking at potentially running a game jam um, which I, I we could we could potentially do with some of the Norwegian students as well um, around COVID and our health officials in New Zealand providing kind of expertise and data and tools uh, and allowing the game development community to utilize our skills around engagement with and changing behaviors and messaging uh, and making things more understandable. Um, yes, yes, the corrupted blood incident in, in WoW is a really interesting, there's a lot of really interesting data around how that contagion spread across WoW. So, um, so that's actually kind of a really interesting model for a pandemic and viral spread. So there are certainly some some interesting lessons to learn, partly because you had so much telemetry around what people were doing in WoW. So you could so you could trace back all of the interactions, which you can't do in a normal population. So so actually there are some interesting deeper lessons that you can learn about those interactions from the spread. Um, ah, so what was that incident? So um, now I'll, I'll probably get this wrong, but I'll get the, the broad picture right, is that um, there was a, uh, a bug in one of the, um, one of the codes for one of the, um, the pets, for one of your, your animal um, um, companions in WoW. And where I think it's when it bit something, it infected, or it, when when it was in the room with other other pets, it infected those pets, um, and so it actually moved through. Um, why is the first reading the thing? Okay, <laughs> so yeah, we'll get we'll get that. Um, so yes, yeah, so the idea is so it actually was a basically it was a viral spread between the pets within the game and so if you went into a room where there were other pets they infected your pets and then your pets infected other pets and so it they although they corrected the the issue um it, it had started spreading through the community right so it was kind of a a spread of this particular um dis disabling um bug that had been written so so yeah so it, um but we can you can look up the the corrupted blood incident uh, in in WoW, and it can yeah, there are some interesting pan like models for virus spread and pandemics. Um, yeah, so it would be debuffing um, pets would despawn before it died in the raid. It was frozen. It would debuff corrupted blood. Um, yeah, so in the, yeah, so there was the yeah, so it was a debuff a corruption. Okay, so reasons for multiplayer. Um, why is it a thing? Okay, so yeah, let's 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 talk about why multiplayer. So um, it's not just saying you know should you make multiplayer games. It's also what do multiplayer bring games bring to your development. There's also risks of creating multiplayer games. But um, so why multiplayer? Well, making single player games. You know, uh, one of the one of the things we try and do is is try and get balance correct. Um, and that's really a big challenge when we're looking at, um, well, it's a, it, it's a challenge to get the AIs to have interesting competition with the player. And so one of the things you get from, from making it multiplayer is you can make your game kind of less complex because you do not have to balance out an AI against the player. You get to make the players balance their games. Um, now, one of the interesting examples of, of balancing games was um, Thud, which is uh, a game from um, the uh, Terry Pratchett universe, but made by Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett said he's not a game designer, but he made this board game Thud, and he couldn't balance the game. But to balance the game, what he did is, you it's trolls versus dwarves, and so one time you play as trolls, and then the next time you play as dwarves, so you swap roles, so you have to play the game twice, 
to balance the game because he couldn't balance the, the, the characteristics of the trolls and the dwarves. So it was just a how much you win by and then you add the two together and that creates balance. And so um, creating with the opponents and, and creating interesting problems and you know network, network play also brings you all of that status and the complexity and the meaning to some of your games. Um, now, some people find multiplayer games disturbing for those same reasons, right? They don't want to play a game that has a status component. They don't want to be judged by other players. And so there are reasons against multiplayer, which are to some extent exactly the same reasons as they are for multiplayer. It's just that people's preferences in play may mean they'll choose not to play multiplayer games. And there are players who explicitly avoid multiplayer games for the exact reason that other people play them, right? Um, so uh, the complexity um, of, of people and the irrationality of people can make play annoying rather than richer. So um, there are there are challenges in both directions. Oh, and, and when you include multiplayer, including features that allow you to do some of these things can be quite useful. So um, cooperative shared play um, and, and shared experiences, uh, one of the things that uh, when, when you're looking at those self-determination theory around motivation to play, one of the aspects of that is relatedness and that can, that feeling that what you're doing is meaningful beyond the game itself. And so some of the multiplayer aspects result in your game behaviours having meaning outside of the game. Right? So, and you know, they have that, that sort of feeling of being part of a winning team or, or being able to discuss it in other contexts with people because they've played together. Uh, and it's, you know, um, there's lots of, of, of being able to meet people. Some people play f for the social aspects. Um, exploring and understanding, because of its multiplayer, you also get some of the mentoring and people can help you explore and help you understand what's going on. Um, there are some people who will avoid it because of the pressure and some people like the pressure of being in a raid um, and together with a clan and you are you f you uh, feel that weight of social pressure to turn up and engage and for some people that is motivating and, and and exciting and for other people that is unnecessary pressure and so it will drive them away from your game so um deciding how much multiplayer your game has is actually one of those design decisions we make as, as game designers um so if we look at types of multiplayer, so we have um, local versus remote. So there, there is a perfectly reasonable multiplayer experience you create. Um, my children have just been enjoying playing Minecraft on the PlayStation 4 um, because it's a slightly different experience to be sitting next to each other on the couch and having the, the multiple screens on a single device. And be, uh, you because you're kind of more together it is you as a team doing stuff it's much harder to be competitive in some of those bases because you don't get to do any of the the sneaking up on other people when you're playing on a single screen together so some of the some of the competitive aspects break down when you have a local local multiplayer versus remote multiplayer and have a server client model um, so understanding the type of multi uh, the scenario the environment of your multiplayer is quite important when you're even at the early stage of designing well what kind of multiplayer are we going to do um also from a networking point of view if you're doing local you can actually just do it on a single program and have multiple views or you can do local player dedicated server with multiple clients that just share parts of the screen um, there are ways of doing that um but Generally, you do it from a single executable rather than trying to run multiple executables. Um, synchronous and asynchronous gameplay. So the idea that you play at the, you're playing at the same time versus playing at different times. Now, um, it might be like play by mail and games like chess, where they are turn based rather than real time, are much easier to do asynchronously because I can make a turn send it to you, you process, think about it, then you make your move and it comes back to me and we go back and forth. Um, there are other ways of running um, synchronous and asynchronous games. Uh, there are ones where um, 
I, I make a sequence of moves and you can make a sequence of moves and they interleave. So um, there are some interesting asynchronous but multiple step um, games uh, that you can create. Uh, and when you're looking at, at long, long lag times, you can redesign your game so that you can cope with one second lag um, because no action has a, a fast turnaround, right? So it, it, it's an interesting kind of discussion around how, like, how you can change the design of your game and the design of the interaction in your game to satisfy some of the issues of, of a loss of synchronous interaction. But hopefully with things like Stadia and um, improved networking that we can decrease some of that, it won't ever go away completely. So it's still useful to think about how you might design an asynchronous version of your game so that people don't have to try and interact with Twitch speed, but with kind of strategic thought. We also have to think about cooperative and competitive games. Um, and are you, are you playing co-op together with shared goals or are you competing against each other? Or are you cooperative and competitive? So where you have like team games where there are a group of us cooperating against another team. And what does that mean for the networking and the, the way we structure our multiplayer when we know that some people are cooperating and, and, and yet they're also competing? Uh, they're also kind of mixed co-op competitive. So uh, you're on the same team, but you're still trying to get to number one spot in your team. So you're competing against another team while collaborating with your team, but competing within your team, right? So it, it can get quite complex how you structure competitive versus cooperative gameplay and, and game teams. Now, um, you might have heard of game theory. Um, and normally, I, when I talk about that I'm teaching game development in computer science, one of the criticisms, like, well, I've got criticisms, one of the questions I get is, oh, do you teach game theory? And it's kind of, well, yes and no. Um, I, I can teach game theory, which is about multiple interactions and, and the theoretical structure of com competition within a scenario, but that's not what game development is about. It's not about mathematical game theory. It's about understanding how you make engaging activities. Um, friendly competition is, is um, an example of a cooperative competitive environment. Um, thanks, um, Victor. Um, I assume, well, Victor Palmerson. Good Twitch name. Um, so, so, but one of the things we get to, once we start doing multiplayer games, we can start analyzing the games we're designing from a game theoretical point of view. And in game theory, we under, we're, we're trying to understand how people interact and what the how we play out that scenario. Right? So in game theory, they'll 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 look at economic systems and say, oh, if you create these kind of incentives, then with rational players competing, you'll end up with this end result. Right? So they're trying to go from from the game scenario and rules you've set up. They play that game, those rules you set up, through to a conclusion. Um, now, there are just, and if we dig deeper, you can look at zero sum games, where when you create a multiplayer environment which has winners and losers, and that the sum of all of the, of the, the results is zero, i.e., I win as much as you lose, then we call those zero sum games. Now, not you're, not all games are zero-sum games, and often they're not, right? You can have people, you know, all of us score some points rather than a win-loss kind of a, approach. Um, there are concepts of Nash equilibriums um, where um, when we talk about uh, the sort of best local decision so that if, if I change any of my, if I change an action, anything I do results in a worse scenario for me. So it's kind of a local maxima that I'm, it's good here, if I change anything, I end up worse off, right? So I'm, I'm in a strategy or I'm in an approach to the game that you've created where I've made a local best position I can be at and anything I would do would make it worse off for me. And so these are ways of analyzing how you've structured your game. 
Um, there's also discussions around bound, bounded rationality and that you, although you might think your agents are rational, sometimes they won't act, act in rational ways because the players don't. Uh, and also this idea that, that there's only so much thinking forward that players can do in a scenario. And so they won't necessarily be able to map out all the actions to the end goal. And so that their, their ability to reason about what actions to take are limited. And, you know, with Fog of War, you create bounded rationality because you limit their access to information about the world. Uh, and so there are some aspects of game theory that we can bring in to what we do when we are talking about multiplayer games and understanding like min-max theories around, around how people make decisions. That starts getting into kind of psychological analysis of how people play multiplayer games. Now, so I, I, I thought of a kind of introduce those as some of the, the aspects of multiplayer. Uh, and then uh, we can get into some of the technology, because you guys are mostly programmers, right? So this is a game programming rather than game design. So I won't dig deeper into some of the good de design issues, but I just thought I'd, I'd shape the start of the discussion with some of those design thoughts and cooperative and, and um, competitive aspects and, and understanding the framing of multiplaying, and then we go into like the detail networking because we're programmers, and you know that's that's going to be our job. Generally, is to do the programming aspects of game development rather than the design aspects. But we have to understand where we fit. So um, now, some of you have done networking. That's all good. You can let, sit back and just let this like wash over you. Um, maybe I should do my ASMR. And so today we will be discussing networking. Networking requires vocabulary such as sockets and packets, headers, IP addresses, protocols, firewalls, and optics. So, um, you know, we could do a relaxing ASMR thing. Luckily, it's not an evening for you, so I'm not going to put you to sleep. But um, so here we have, you know, so we have some vocabulary, um, which hopefully you've heard of before. Um, if you haven't, then maybe you sh like you, you might want to at the end pause me if you're going to watching me later go and have a look at some of these things and then come back um so so sockets and protocols um and we'll talk about some of these now and um kind of discuss some of 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 the the language around networking that we do when we're implementing those multiplayer features so um this is where i'd ask you kind of you know do you know all the networking protocols? Hey, like so, kind of working out what what percentage of the class is incredibly comfortable with all of the networking features, and so I can just skip all of this stuff and do Q and A around multiplayer. Or like, do you know UDP and TCP/IP um, and uh, replication protocols around updating objects? What do people know in the Twitch community there? So, um, ha like the question, I suppose one of the questions is, have you all done networking courses or are there some of you who haven't done networking courses? So if somebody could say, kind of, are there some of you who have not done a, a TCP IP networking course? Or have you all been forced to do one of those to get to this point? Okay. So at least one of you hasn't done a networking course. Okay, so. I'll go through this stuff. Um, any networking at all? Okay. Right, so some of us have done them. Okay. Um, okay, well, so some of you have done some networking, some haven't. So this is going to be a reasonable discussion for some of you. It's an overview for those who have seen it before. Correct me down below if I get anything wrong here, okay? So you can, you can help by by, by correcting me in case I say anything wrong um, or asking me interesting, deeper questions. Okay, so... Um, so the, the idea here is we're, that like when, we, when we look at protocols versus um, kind of and, and the level that a protocol is, so a protocol is a description of a process and there are network layer and transport layer. So there's there's different layers that we have protocols at, and we for networking, what most of you will end up doing, most, male, potentially, 
is using a networking library. However, that library sits on top of a networking protocol at an application level, which sits on, on top of a networking protocol at, a, um, at the physical layer of the network, uh, and then a hardware layer, right? So there's, there's a bunch of layers of protocols. Most of you don't have to dig to those lower, lower protocols. Some of you, if you want to become network engineers, will be understanding routing tables on an operating system level and understand how those routers move packets around the internet. Game developers generally don't have to go to that level to create multiplayer games, right? So, um, so when you kind of are understanding a protocol, understanding you know um, what level it's at, what it's referring to, what part, what data you're sending, um, kind of matters. So for us, we'll dig a little bit down and then we'll go back up to the 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 use level. So. Um, to understand those layers, uh, they, they, the ISO organization created this model of, of networking with seven layers. This is a lie, this doesn't happen, this is just a theoretical conception of what it should look like. We don't actually do this, um, but you might, have, you might have seen this before. And when you start looking at networking layers, you'll, you'll, you'll often find this model which has these multiple layers, seven layers. and we're working at that application layer, but they talk about a presentation, a session, a transport, a network, a data, and physical layer, right? So um, it tends to actually be more of kind of just four layers, right? So we have your application, which is sending data back and forth. There is a layer beneath that, um, and for example, this could be a UDP, which is a transport layer. So we have the application layer, we have a transport layer, which could be UDP, or TCIP, some people call, put TCIP up high in the application layer. You can call it a transport layer. So TCP IP is um, a transport um, TCP uh, con transport control protocol over internet protocol. So is uh, so UDP is universal data packet. So that's a that's a transport layer protocol. UDP doesn't know its order and doesn't correct for lost packets, TCP does. So these are two different things. And actually you do, as game developers, have to worry about that level, right? So most programmers only worry about the application level, right at the top here, right? Most of them only care about that. Um, game developers actually will care about the transport layer, right? They'll care about that one because speed of your networking is important. Uh, and so we go down as far as TCP IP, yeah, TCP IP and UDP and making the decision between those two. And I'll explain that a bit further. Um, IP, the actual internet and understanding your IPv6 versus your IPv4 and how you actually construct an, an IP packet and header. Eh, we don't usually go there. And my game developers don't generally actually go down into the network interface protocol of the network card and code up anything in that OS space, right? So the link is the operating system. We don't generally touch that. So we're usually at the top two layers of the structure. So um, when we look at what we're building on, right? So understanding the foundation of what we're building on, we're building on top of an IP data and IP packet. And so that generally has this kind of structure where we've got a bunch of header information a source and a destination IP address and some some options and padding, right? So we have this this large header. So every packet, every time you communicate, you're going to get an IP header header added to your packet, and it's going to be going to look a bit like this, right? Now some of those sizes, when we go to IPv6, they get larger, right? But it still has similar checksums and the protocol and identifiers and, and a whole bunch of additional information, which is why you don't want to spend send tiny, tiny bits of data. So if you try and send lots and lots of tiny bits of data, every time you try and send that data, it's gonna get all this header added to it. So what we do when we're networking and making multiplayer games is we have to coalesce data to make it large enough to be worth sending, right? So you can't just naively send every little bit independently. You have to kind of buffer things together and send them as a packet, right? So this is, that's, that's the header reason why. When we look at TCP, so we come up this to the transport layers, which is when we actually make these decisions, 
we start seeing there's another large header that sits on top, like that is inside, right? So, the, so when we look here, um, you can see that this, this UDP data and the UDP header, that purple header, is added on top of our data. And then the IP data is on top of that again. So, so this and this happens in front of the actual data. Now, with the TCP header, one of the, the, the second layer, right? So you've got source and destination port. Now, this is port rather than IP. So you would have seen, um, potentially, when, you're, when, you're, when you've been playing games or when you've tried to do some, some um, connecting to servers, you might have heard of the concept of a port. Now, a port is just sort of an abstract concept that when a packet of data arrives at my machine, I need to know which application cared about that. And so they created this idea of, of, of having a port number, which was, a oh, I've arrived at your machine, and I'm going to go and sit in this area so programs that care about port 80 will go and look in the array at position 80 and find the data that came to this machine and was put into that port. Now, port 80 happens to be the HTTP protocol. Uh, yes, so an application level protocol, TCP, HTTP is one layer higher, and it puts things in port 80 so my, pro my, my computer can have a program, a web server for example, that is listening to port 80. When someone requests something on port 80, what happens? The packet arrives at my machine, it gets put into that location, and this program knows to look at that location to see what was there. Okay, And so that's what TCP does, is it works out the port number. The IP is in the, the, the outside, right, because it's the IP layer, so we've, we're narrowing the closer to the data. So the port number is put in here, as well as the sequence number because TCP knows the order in which it sent data so that it can reconstruct it. Um, and now you see a word that I mentioned before, octet. Um, so, so octets are, are what the networking people basically refer to as, as, as bytes, but they don't want to call them bytes, they call them octets. So that's, that's a... a the term that's used for the networking packets because they are not you, they're not standard bytes that they are an octet and you'll see that word in, in some of the networking stuff they have eight bits per octet um, technically octet is a is the more accurate phrase than byte because byte was just made up because it's you had a bit and when you had a whole bunch of bits you had a whole byte. Um, so it's kind of, uh, um, but octet is eight things. So to some extent, that's actually a better word for it, but byte's the one we use. But you realize that networking people will sometimes do non-standard stuff. <coughs> okay, so you also see window size and there's a, um, a checksum again to validate data. So, so this has got source and destination ports. When we're networking in games, we do have to know something about ports, and it's partly that it's in this level of protocol that those ports get decided. Because the internet protocol is how we send data to machines. The ports is telling that machine, oh, which program should care about it. Uh, as games, often we will have our own gaming ports. However, some routers, and some firewall walls will uh, will have packets arrive at the machine, and the firewall will say, "Oh yeah, no, 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 I don't listen to any ports except these ones that I allow in. Everything else, I'm just going to stop, and no one's allowed to see them, right? Because it creates a big firewall to stop stuff coming in. Um, and so we have to find a way of hole punching through that firewall." And so games have have to deal with some of those issues because we are trying to turn your machine into a server. And so it, it has to be able to listen to the network, right? So that makes it significantly different to just listening to um, HTTP packets and sending a request and getting, getting a web page back over the network, 
right? So, or sending email and getting email back over the network. Actually playing games, we tend to have our own program that connecting, and if we're playing multiplayer, we have to serve data, and it's more complex. Okay, so, um, networking is hard. All of that stuff is hard. Understand, like, programming all of that, setting all of that stuff up. It's challenging, right? And we have network, we have network engineers, right? And that's their job. Um, there is no point in reinventing the wheel. So usually what we do is we actually just use libraries to do our networking for us, and we just have to make some choices around do are we doing safe or unsafe in terms of what happens when we lose packets. So if we don't care, we can use things like UDP. If we care about every packet needing it in order, then we use TCP. And making those choices is really important for, for the optimality of your game, making sure your game is playable, because if you don't have to guarantee every every packet gets through, then you can have, you know, a bad like a Wi-Fi connection and it'll drop in a packet occasionally and your game's still playable. If you have to wait for every single packet to come in and you're doing it in the safest way that you get every packet, then sometimes your game will pause because your network's laggy because it dropped the packet and it had to send back a request to the server say, oh Oh, it appears that I've dropped packet 15. Could you resend packet 15? And the server will go, oh, packet 15, yeah, I can get that for you, and it will send you back packet 15, and eventually that will arrive, right? But then if you're just sitting there waiting for that to arrive, your game freezes, and that's pretty annoying. If, however, you can go, oh, I don't care about 15, um, I'm just waiting for 16 and 17. I get 16 and 17, I can see it's got all the data I need, so I can just ignore that I didn't get 15, right? So, so the idea is like, can you structure the way that you communicate in your game networking and the way that your multiplayer works such that you don't need every piece of information in the order it was sent? So libraries deal with a bunch of this. We have to make that level of decision, but the libraries do most low-level coding. And this is where we start going from going from the protocols, which are the description of how things communicate to an interface where I just send stuff, right? Um, so I just say, oh, it's, it's, it's an API. Programming, programming interface, I'll just use the interface rather than try and work within a protocol, I'll use a, an API and an interface. So when we start looking at that interfaces um, and APIs, we can look at, at having user registration, high school list, deleted boards. These are kind of APIs which just say, oh, you send me this information as a message and I will store it, and you ask it for me, I'll give you this back, right? So so I'm not building low-level packet data to try and optimize things and trying to understand a protocol around how I send things and how I construct a UDP packet and how I construct um, my, my game information. I'm just using a service, and it tells me this is how you form the, the string and send it to me, right? So that's kind of an API. Um, when we're talking about lower level protocols, you can actually get game servers which will allow you to set up data and create and use protocols around what is being defined and uh, what is data and what is, is um, header and you get to kind of shape more of that. So rather than just using what's there with an API, you, with a protocol, you get to define some of your own behaviors. Um, and you know, there, so there are there are protocols around things like changing shard to a new server. So if you're playing a multiplayer game and you're playing in one server and you need to move to another server, um, rather than that often just being an API call, you have to actually decide a protocol around how you move ownership of information in one network environment to information in the other server. Right. So this uh, becomes a a more complex interaction. So one of the Again, kind of coming back up to what we do as an application, one of the things we do is the first kind of naive thing we do is just use messaging, right? Now, messaging sits right at the top. It basically sits on top of TCP IP and says, what we do is let's just not worry about performance at the moment, and we'll just send basically strings back and forth over the network, and I'll message you. I will then have a string processing at my end that understands what what I'm trying to do, and there'll be string processing your end, we'll just let the network be itself and just send those strings. All right, so networking is, but in this case, is by sending messages. Um, 
So it's easy to customize because we're just sending a string to each other. So I can decide what I do when I get a string. That's easy. Um, but as you get kind of further away, sending large strings takes longer. And so your game becomes less optimal and you're not optimizing for any of the data and like the data packet sizes or anything like that. So, so it's not great, but it's a good start. And if you're playing local multi, multi, local multiplayer over a LAN or in the same machine, the network delay is, is irrelevant. So you can send just as messaging, right? So if you know the environment you're in and you know you're not trying to play transatlantic, yeah, messaging's probably fine. So um, zero MQ is the one that that I I still think is one of the best for low level messaging networking. Right, so if you're if you're using SFML or you're using a C++ programming language, actually um, zero MQ works across a number. It has it has um, ports into a number of languages. Um, it's fast. It's reliable. It's a distributed messaging system. Its core is implemented in C uh, and is embeddable within C programs. Um, and it offers soft sockets and atomic communication. So what you do is you open up a port, you send it and it's atomic so that it won't you won't have to worry about you sending multiple messages and them getting kind of overlapping and getting delayed and and coming out different at the other end uh and so long as you're communicating two zero and q programs together they guarantee atomic message sending so they'll they'll send the back and forth and handshake to make sure they received what you sent um and you can use this for within process communication, inter process communication. It uses TPP and also will do multicast where it casts out to everybody in a group. Um, there is, like uh, underneath it, a whole concurrent programming framework. Um, so, you know, it's it's got quite a kind of well implemented multi, uh, multi threaded system. Um, and it's designed to work relatively effectively when you have uh, multi cores. Um, so it's, you know, it, although it it's somewhat heavyweight because it just sends strings back and forth. Uh, it's also a nice way to get started. So if we have a look, um, we generally have a client and a server in the standard model. Uh, and so we have some sort of, of, a server is someone who listens for a request and provides a reply. So that's the rec is a request and the rep is a reply. So I'm sitting there as a server waiting for you to say something. A message comes in saying hello. My program looks at the message, sees the, the, the character H, the character E, the character L, the character L, the character O, and goes, oh, you've said hello, matches that, and goes, oh, what should I do in response? And I'll re return a string world, right? So that would be a message passing. Now, all of the IP protocols and the network transfer protocols and all that sort of stuff is handled by 0MQ in this case, uh, but that's the kind of model I then build for, for my networking system. So if we have a look at that from an actual code perspective, because this is a game programming course, um, then you can see that we have, you know, relatively standard um, C++ code with 0MQ at the top. And we're, we're creating sockets, which are, sockets are the, the combination of a kind of IP address and a port. So we create a socket. Uh, and you can see that we've got a socket, which is here, the socket bind of st uh, like TCP. So that, that red line, that third line after main there, um, that is, is using star as local host. So it's just doing it locally and it's binding, which means it connecting the, the string and it's a TCP is the protocol star is local host colon five, five, five is the port. So that tells it the packets that are going to be sent and where they're going to be sent to. Uh, and then it sets up, and I hate while trues, but that's the standard way you do this networking stuff. It, this is a, a, a server, uh, as it says at the top there, right? It says it's a server. Um, and so it's going to sit and it's going to listen for a request, right? So it does a socket receive on request. In this case, it um, prints out received hello. It doesn't actually care whether it received hello, this particular program. It's just going to pretend that it received hello. Whatever you send it, it's going to say, oh, I received hello. Um, it then has a sleep one, which means it just sleeps, um, and then sends a message reply, does a mem copy of some data world, and it says five characters into 
the the reply data and then it sends that reply which says the word world okay so um now this is then spent and so if it doesn't receive anything it waits one second doesn't reply and then waits and doesn't reply anyway. so it's it's just sitting there waiting to to do these interactions okay so here it actually blocks out on this one to um to on on here this this wait for next request from client this version is a blocking version so this thread stops until it gets notified right and so that's how the c plus the zero mq socket which is what i created up here zmq socket t that's how it sits and waits for a packet to arrive right and and it will not keep going through this program until that packet arrives right so this is this is the uh, a simple way of dealing with networking that creates the server and then this would be the equivalent clock client on localhost again 555 so here i've got someone once i run that program i can have it sitting there waiting for something to send me a message um, here i uh, connect to localhost um, column 555 so it connects that socket that i again i create a socket connects the socket and then 10 times it will send hello uh, and um, again using meme coffee puts it in the packet sends the packet with the socket send and gets the reply on a socket receive and see out the string the request nbr is is this what what it received right um, and and so it that's how it will send to the server and the server sends a message back right so that's networking and you know if you we're doing very simple networking and you just want to know my position in the game, my XY position. You could just say, you know, player or P1 colon 5 colon 50 could say that I'm at position P player 1 is at position 5 X and 50 Y. Right. And then I would just use that string to set the position of the player at the other end. Ha. Huh. Um, hello. Hi. Um, hi. Syracuse. Um, I'm glad you've attended my courses. I'm still teaching. You might at like look less. I'm still here. Um, can't, they can't get rid of me. Um, so I'm still teaching to Norway, which is yeah, what we're doing at the moment. So that's the the client and a server showing in, in, in TCP IP. And basically, that's that's all you need for messaging, right? And then all the rest of it is just adding more data around what you send and what you receive and how you process those messages. Now, that's if you're doing a messaging level. Once you need to be more optimal, then you need to start actually constructing packets, and that becomes more complex, right? But, but, and then we can start looking at, at the other patterns rather than just having a server and a receiver. We start thinking, well, maybe we have peer to peer, and maybe we need to send better data or optimize our data, and so it becomes kind of an interesting challenge. So, um, so this is when we kind of look at a, a publish and we have subscribers, so we have a server that is going to make data available to us and we have lots of people who are listening to that and this becomes more of a broadcasting um, uh, um a, a broadcasting service so so yes harasukas this is part of a lecture to my students in norway um i'm i'm 50 minutes in so you're joining us in the middle that's fine um but i'll so i'll continue so um here we see the c code for a broadcast server right so this would be something like a the example here is a, a weather update server uh, and so the idea is that um, you can create a server that will have various people register for updates and when the server wants to send an update it will send those to all the clients that are listening right so it doesn't it's not waiting for a request from the client it will send it to everybody on the list right so um, so here this is again we're binding to sockets um, but we're binding as a, a a publisher and so um, when we say publish send this publish um, we both use the tcp and we have the um, ipc right so we have multiple protocols and we can use those broadcasting protocols and this is an example of a client listening to that weather right so so again 
two sort of one pages of of code to do networking and to do networking in different ways. Okay, so so although we say you know, networking can be hard when you're doing it like this and you're using a library like Zero and a Cube, it's not that bad, right? It's actually kind of okay. Um, so so once we get like so so we've got client server, we've now seen a publisher where you subscribe and you get you everybody can be updated. When we're looking at, at um, clients which have have asynchronous client server, um, so the clients connect and send a request. For each request, this, the server sends zero or more replies. So this is where we kind of have some combination of a server that isn't just connected to one person, it's connected to multiple people and it's having to deal with packets coming from them. Um, and it can send multiple requests. And so this becomes this asynchronous rather than I have to send you something and then you send it back, we are now kind of connected. I'll send you stuff occasionally, you send me stuff occasionally, we are now talking, rather than a strict, formal send, receive. Send, receive. All right, so because games often have multiple events, sometimes the client doesn't need to send events, sometimes the server needs to send multiple events before the client responds, sometimes the client needs to send multiple thing, events before the server responds. So we don't want this lockstep, we do want this ability to both send and receive. And so that's when we start saying, you know, how do we do that? I'm not gonna dig further into code because there's only so much code you can show during a lecture because people get really bored with code. So um, you want more? There is a whole guide to using ZeroMQ to do networking in various interesting ways and how to set up these this system. So I'm gonna send you there um, to look for more of this, okay? now. That's if you're programming at a programming level, and you can use it for any kind of networking you're doing, not just games. This is, you know, anything where you want multiple systems to interact. Uh, now, the the last bit of code I'll show you is that this is multi-threaded because um, this spinning up a networking thread. If you put a blocking call, the wait, that wait call, um, just above the arrow there, if you put that in your code and it's in the middle of normal gameplay code, then your program will halt waiting for the network. You never want that, right? So, you, so the things we talk about with optimization and multi-threading, you need to do that to get this networking stuff to work, right? So this needs to spin up a, a thread that sits listening to the network port and making sure the network port works. There are ways you can do some of this with notifies that that spin off an asynchronous call and then wait for and, and the program continues and will have an event a function that's listening for an event and when the networking finishes it will trigger that event in your program and then you can read the data right so there are there are ways you can set this up so that you have those threads kind of set up for listening rather than just sitting there spinning so we don't just have you know that we send data. We also have to understand that our data comes as a queue, rather than as atomic data. We don't get all the data all at once. We get it arriving in sequence. And so when you have a message in and a message out, there'll be some length of time between when I send a message and when I receive that message. And so we have these data structures, this sort of a queue where we're pushing things in one end and coming out the other. And um, when we're looking for for why that matters, we start saying, well, if you're looking at synchronous gaming, when I talked about you know the types of gaming, synchronous gaming, um, when we're synchronous, all players are running a local simulation and it's all deterministic. You can, you're all being completely synchronous. Um, as you move towards asynchronous gaming, where you're actually not quite in exactly the same world, we we see this basically whenever there is a server and clients at a distance from each other, the server, once that time gets long, might be one frame ahead of the clients because it takes time to send the message from here to the server. Um, now, that means we're not perfectly synchronous and this, the client isn't waiting for the server to update before the client shows something new on screen. That immediately creates a version of asynchronous gaming. Um, now, with Stadia, and streaming, 
um, where we we send our inputs to the server and then wait for the video feed from the server. That's synchronous, right? Because we're all on the same server, all the data's on the server, all of our inputs go to that server and then just come back as, as video feed, right? Um, that's one of the new styles of gaming that we've now got because of, of fast internet. And that means that they can, we can do synchronous games even though it's not local. Once we're asynchronous, we will have some things ahead of the, so, so well, that way. Um, so some, some games will be doing things and the server will be doing things at a different time. And so we're going to potentially, we will be ahead of the server in some sense, as in because we are doing things and we've sent message, the server hasn't seen that message yet. Eventually, a frame later, the, the server will receive it and we're already a frame ahead. And then the server will send the response and we're now two frames ahead. Um, so we are ahead of of the state that when we get the message back from the server. Uh, and so we have to decide what we do when we're now out of step. Um, and, you know, there are various different responses depending on the network architecture you're using in your game. If you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer where I we talk directly, we have to work out who owns the game state and who decides what is true. Um, and uh, we have to kind of work out if we've got a, a dedicated server, if we've got a listening server, if we've got a migrating server that can move around the clients. So all of these kind of questions come up as to how you manage the server-client relationship uh, and, and how you do this kind of asynchrony thing is depending on who owns the data and who owns the real true world state. Because if the server owns the world state and it says, I'm the server, so I own the world, all of the clients have to resync with the server when the server sends updates, right? So the clients don't own data, they're just viewing data. In peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, we have more challenges because here with the server, we all of us only need to know the IP address in the, the, the server, um, but for um, in a peer-to-peer, -peer, we all have to share IP addresses and work out how to get to each other, and it's it's a bunch more complex from a, a server and firewall perspective um, from setting up a, your firewall and getting all that um, network address um, tunneling that you need to do. So so peer-to-peer -peer tends to be more complex for the networking side than a client server. And now that's why you see in Unity, um, they've moved to actually third parties offering server hosting solutions rather than Unity, which was doing Unit, kind of having to run those servers itself. They were finding that that was overloading that aspect of the company. And so now what they've done is they've got rid of their networking and they're now kind of pushing people off onto third party server suppliers that you pay to be the servers for you so that you do client server and you pay a third party KR company to be your service and you do networking that way. So networking has kind of been shunted out of Unity into a third party thing that runs your service for you and so you don't have to manage this kind of client server or peer to peer, you just use the service and it deals with it. So, so as I said, one of the problems with peer to peer is hole punching. Uh, and that's where you've got the firewall on your machine. It's blocking off a whole bunch of ports. How do you get through? Well, you need um, uh, a translation service. And so sometimes you can, so one of the ways they do this is you hole punch through. Um, you can either set up on your router locally. You go into the firewall on your wireless router and open ports and allow ports to be seen. One of the problems of working on a university network is you don't have access to the firewall list of, of concealed ports. And so sometimes what you, the multiplayer that you set up at home and you do on your home network and between you two in your homes will be fine because some of those port numbers are open by default and so your home system will just allow them through. But the university may have locked off a ranges and said, no, 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 you, 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 can't, you, know, you can't talk to any of them. And so, what would work perfectly as a multiplayer game in your home environment will not work at the university. Kind of annoying. Now there are ways around that and you can get around firewalls now by, by going through other ports and then redirecting them once they arrive. Yeah, so there is there is there are ways around this. Um, 
some of these services use no import communication as a way of getting around the firewalling of of unknown specialist ports again as a programmer um, understanding why something doesn't work is quite useful because you know oh it doesn't work at university it's pro it might be to do with ports I'll have to work out a networking service solution for that or maybe I just can't test it at, at, at university so um, right so that so client server that's peer-to-peer -peer. client server model we generally have a single hub a bit easier because everybody just needs to know one address and sends it to there and then it sends it back um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, Unreal 4 because it still has the networking embedded and Epic still allows you to use their networking protocols and their, resol their, their server res resolution system, um, whereas um, Unity's kind of moved to a, a third party system. You know, I've got some, some um, pages to show you in Unity, show you the latest stuff they're trying to do. Um, but we'll talk Unreal first and then we'll go into Unity. So, So in Unreal, um, it uses the server defines the truth. So the server client model it has is server has the real state of everything. Right? Usually that's usually that's true for most um, client server games. The server is the, the source of truth. Um, but there'll be some time lag between you and the server. So how do we deal with information from the past? And, and how do we deal with... Oh, I got to do that. So, to deal with information past, from the past, we have to understand who owns the state. And to understand who owns the state, we have to say, well, if this, and, and as the state moves and the server moves, how do we migrate that from one owner to another? And how do we do, avoid duplication and, or multiple executions? Um, one of my favorite bugs, and this is when, when I was uh, just starting university, I had Diablo, right? Um, so Diablo, great game, really loved it, really liked Diablo. One of the interesting things you could do was when you opened a portal to go back to the town, if you, you, you open up the portal and you stepped into the portal, and as you stepped into the portal, you dropped a... Uh, a bag of gold or you dropped a, a potion now they did the copy of your um, inventory as you entered the portal they then ran the animation of the portal spinning and then moved you to town they did the copy of the state of the world when they moved you to town so there was a small window between you stepping into the portal as they ran the swirling animation and you stepping into the town where you could drop something in that gap and because I'd already taken a copy of the player that item would appear both in the level still and in my own inventory right because I'd already taken the copy of the player when I worked in the portal when I copied, took a copy of the level when I left the portal and so you could do um, teleport um, multiplication of items by dropping them as you walk through a teleport um, so, so this ownership is, is an interesting challenge. Now, yeah, I, I've only got a couple more slides I was going to talk about. Uh, and so, and then we can do a break. Okay, so, yep. Um, do a couple, couple more slides and then we can do some Q&A and you guys can ask me some questions and I can show you some of the other Unity stuff. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so we have this, this idea of, of travel and, and network travel, right? So, Seamless movement is where we try and um, and kind of understand how the how we load new data. So when we when we're handing over that item, how do we do that seamless transmission, bring in new data into the game over the network, uh, and predict the data that the client will need from the server? So there's a bunch of kind of networking protocol issues that we start dealing with when we're trying to send that data back and forth and saying, well. That's, the server has the ground truth, so when we get it in, we update it. Now, one of the, the neat things that, that uh, Halo did in its networking, when it had this, this issue of, of the, the client being behind the server, is that you, would, you might have noticed this in some network games. You'll notice that sometimes they go all chunky, and they kind of flick, 
when you have characters move because I got ahead and then I had to update my position with what the server thought was true and so it just jumps my character so I get this flick as I get an update from the network. So what Halo did is it noticed it was having this problem. So instead of having a, a unit here and then the server saying, well actually the unit's not there, it's there. So instead of kind of going, Dink, what it does is it's, oh, oh, you want, you want me to be over here? Oh, what I'll do is I'll go take three or four game cycles. I'll look at how this unit's moving and I'll say, well, it was going like that. And now you want it to go like that, right? So you thought it was here and I think it's here. What I'll do is I'll go like that and then I'll just bend it over to where you think it should be. So instead of following the path that the server thinks, the client continues the way it was going and then it bends it over and moves it to where it needs to be. So this idea of kind of taking a couple of frames to reorient yourself back to what you're getting from the server. So that's how they did some of the smoother networking is that they didn't, they didn't actually get better network performance. What they did is they just changed the way they interpreted the signal from the server to say rather than jump myself to where I need to be, I will take two frames to interpolate myself to that new location. And so it blends it in. Okay, so, so that was one of the ways you, they, they dealt with this server client issue and being behind the server state. Now, um, just a couple of things, and I know I'm four minutes past the break. Um, in, in Unreal, if you're doing Unreal networking, there are a few kind of tips and tricks that you'll see that are kind of interesting words. One of them is net, net update frequency. And you'll see this in most, in, in most game engines that are using some kind of network update thing. There will be a frequency that you can tell the, the, um, the networking system, oh, how often should this be updated? So what you can do is you can decrease that for things that you don't really care if they're sh shared in real time, but that they are useful to share at some point. For things that you want the player to interact with and kind of have synchronous, you, you kind of wind up the, the frequency of updates. And for things that don't absolutely need player attention, you can wind down the update. And so that, that controls some of the networking frequency. You can also set this to kind of dynamically adapt to the network load. So the game engine will look at how loaded up the network is and you can tell it, oh, if you've got capacity, do this. If you don't, well, you can get this, take this one away first and take this one away, they can take this one away to just try and decrease capacity. And so that's where you look at kind of a max update frequency. And there's a min net update frequency so that you can actually set up your games so that you might not kill like so so you can kind of have a buffer so let's say you go down to 10 frames a second and it like if you are 10 frames a second and your friends at 60 frames a second they're getting a smooth game but you're all still operating at a reasonable rate it could be that once you drop below 10 frames a second you can set that minimum update and the server will slow the game down because the slowest player isn't able to keep up right so that's a an option you have as a network and when you're making your network games is to is to work out do you slow the whole game down when you get to that minimum update frequency so that nobody is kind of lagged to death right so if, if something gets really bad everybody slows down a bit right um and the world slows down but if so long as you're within the range the world will keep updating at normal speed right so these are that's the kind of one of the things you can set so for Unreal, there's lots of good tutorials. So I've left those in. You can go and have a look at those. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things you can do that, that help optimize quantization. Rather than sending full data, you break it into small bits and, and send just the quantized bits. And um, we can talk about cheating. I'll come back and I'll talk about that after the break. And we'll talk a little bit about what's happening with Unity Multiplayer. Uh, and why they changed it and how and why um, UNET was deprecated. So we'll take a five minute break so you guys can go off and do stuff. Um, and um, I'll, I'll grab myself a drink and I'll come back and we'll talk Unity networking and some of the cheating issues. All good? Hey, JBug. Um, yeah, this is. I'm, I'm universally lecturing. I do it on Twitch because it's kind of a, one of the nicer ways of doing streaming. 
and my students in Norway kind of like Twitch, so that's why I'm I'm Twitch streaming. Uh, I'm assuming JBug1031 is not one of the standard students, but has kind of wandered into the classroom. Um, but you know, that's cool. We're happy to have have people join. So uh, now, if you do have any classrooms, uh, any, any questions, you can ask them down there. Um, Okay, well, I'll take the five minute break. You guys take a five minute break. I'll be back in a sec. Get myself to it. Um, um, we're just on a break at the moment. Um, yeah, so so uh, uh, they one of the students asked for a break, so we just I'm just letting him go, you know, get a drink and that sort of stuff. And and I see some of them asking me some questions, so I'll I'll be back into doing some Q and A in a minute. But. Oh, right. That's right. No, it's just the way I had a pair of headphones on, so that I could concentrate on my English writing. Ah, right. And I, I can hear you mumbling, but. I, Nice. Nice. Otherwise I'll, I'll be hearing what you're saying and, and not being able to concentrate. Yes. Yep. No, I'm, I'm quite loud when I lecture. Well, I, I hope you are, because I'd hate you to be whispering in that lecture. I expect you to be there. I suppose uh, dancing around the room is fine. <laughs> no, so I, well, you know, I have, I have danced around the rooms when I've, I've been giving some of my lectures in the lab, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here at my dad's house. It's Friday night, so I'm, I'm taking time. Uh, and I was just, my dad was just chatting to me about the lecture because you know, I'm, I'm talking relatively loudly, and it's, it's quarter past eleven at night. So, um, okay, so we have, we have a couple of questions there. Um, can a network develop any systematic issues like hu um, humans with COVID? Who? Um, Well, I mean, you could look at some of the way that um, routing protocols work, and you could have a a denial of service attack, for example. You could look at having a cut as as being a systematic issue, um, because that's where some part of your network is flooding the network with packets. Um, now, often this is a hacker who's trying to to bring you down, so a denial of service attack. Um, now, usually, a, a standard defense against a denial of service attack is to block that port or block that IP address and say, oh, 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 no, everything coming from there, I'll just ignore, right? So I don't have to sit, my computer doesn't have to, they're reading all those packets and not being able to do anything else. Um, so what they do is they don't do a single denial of service attack, they do a distributed denial of service attack. So they DDoS you. Um, and that means where they use a bunch of zombie... Um, uh, machines. So, so there's a bunch of machines that are connected to the internet, have ports open. I mean, we talked about networking and ports. I have ports open that are that were listening for things like network connections or remote procedure calls, and people scan those ports, find the the machine that's sitting somewhere that's on and listening, and they take it over, and then they build up a network of those machines that are kind of all over the world with all different IP addresses, and they take them over, and then when they want to try and bring someone down, they use all of those machines from all over the world to attack and to, to send and clog up the data. And so you can't just block a single IP address because that's not going to work because they're all of these IP addresses from all over the world. Now, some of them were mostly in one country, so some servers will block every everything from a country, which means like individual users in those countries can't access it, but at least everybody the, the system stays stable. Um, 
so yeah, so you, you can look at there are there are some networking system systematic um, failure points that are to do with just sending too much data through, and you could kind of think of that as a bit like you know the immune response in human beings, and it though these are not usually internally the system doing it, it's usually an attacker, but then a virus is an attacker as well. So in a sense, yes, it is like COVID where there is something that's trying to break the system and is is kind of using it inappropriately to, um, you know, potentially you could think of, of, of COVID a bit like spam emails or something like that, where its goal isn't to bring down the network. It's not actually a, it's not an attacker as in it's trying to kill the host. It's just trying to replicate, right? And that's what spam's trying to do. Spam email is just trying to get you to buy stuff, right? It's trying to replicate. But if it gets too heavy, if it gets too much, it overloads the system and brings it down. And it takes itself with it, right? So, so when you die with a virus, that's the virus failing, right? The virus doesn't want to kill you. It just wants to sit there and kind of use your resource to replicate itself and that's kind of what spam's doing right so so yeah no there are you can you can look at those similarities between networking and and kind of viruses and how systems break okay so um how do you actually um well how do you actually usually get around the fact that many of your players might have their router block incoming connections right so um the usual way honestly, is actually you run a server. Um, and that's partly what Unity is now suggesting people do, is that you you have a cloud-based server somewhere, and so you don't have individual clients operating as servers. And so what happens is that your game, to communicate to the server, the client has reached out. And when I reach out through my firewall, the firewall goes, oh, you're a program you came to the firewall and said, oh, hey, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to send information to this and it'll send me back on this port. And so the firewall goes, oh yeah, I'll let that happen. It goes out and comes back in and it translates for you between those ports and it, it allows that communication. When, if you want the client to be a server, if you want, if I want to run the game from my machine in my house, then yeah, there are problems, right? Because how do you get, uh, how do other machines know the IP address? Because usually, I the, like what happens in most homes is that my router, actually the router here is over there, my router has an IP address, which is the internet protocol address, again, dynamically allocated, so it changes on a weekly or monthly basis, but it's got an IP address. The IP address of this machine is actually just a local one within this network because there aren't enough IP addresses for every machine to have its unique worldwide number. Well, V6 it does, but V4 it didn't. But I have a local address within the network. And when I communicate out through the world, I communicate through the servers, uh, the, my router's IP address. And it uses port mapping to translate that to this machine, right? You can go and look at how all that works. So when I want my machine to be a server and I want to tell people how do I how do they get to it, it's a problem because I don't have a static IP address, so my IP address could change. So I can't just give you a name of, you know, this is my network name because I can't map I don't have a domain name server that maps between that name and a specific number because it's dynamic and changes and that number's for the router, not for this machine. So yeah, no, um, that's why we, you, you, you had to set up um, your routing table and you had to get static IP addresses and, and just, you know, you, you'd still need it because even with all of that, you still needed a server that you could tell. So, so the way around it is that you would have a server. I, on my machine, would tell the server all the details of how to get to me. You, as someone who wanted to play a game with me, would go to the server, find all my details, find out the process, and then be able to map to me, right? So you still needed a server to do the management of the protocols to get in and out of machines. Much harder to do it actually peer to peer. And so that's kind of, and, and that's basically why UNet they got rid of because they didn't want to be managing all of the games that were made with Unity all of the multiplayer aspects through their server to do all that remapping 
because that's a massive server load for every game, well, every game made with Unity. Um, even though the games themselves are, are setting up their own server and being multiplayer, because of the networking issue, they would still have to have the the communication server that had all the details of how to get in and out of my network port and how to get to me would have to be stored somewhere. And that was overloading. So that's why they've kind of got rid of Unit and said, right, okay, if you want to do this now, you need you need as a developer to choose a cloud partner. So real P2P should be avoided. Yeah, it's a nightmare to do real P2P uh, over a network. If you're uh, over, uh, well, if you're if you're stepping outside of your own wireless network, right? So so lo like local peer-to-peer. -peer. So if I'm we're if we're all on the same wireless network, great, fine, local peer-to-peer, -peer, all good, right? Because you know we're in the same network. Um, we're not going through a router and getting our IP changed and having to, to do the interaction. Right? You can still do it, it just requires your users to do a whole bunch of setup and to go and edit their their routing table in their firewall. And just most of them are not willing to do that. Right? So, yeah. Um, all right, okay, so, hi, Yon. I'm, I, uh, so, right, so you would have done this class last year with um, Richard, right? Because I wasn't teaching this class last year. Um, unfortunately, it's an issue with employment and making sure we can hire people that, that Richard is, is only going to be going, coming and doing a guest lecture um, in next month, uh, yeah, in, in October slash early November. He'll come and give some guest lectures. Um, but we can't hire him apparently full time because of employment law. But um, yeah, no, I'm just I'm just um, uh, giving the lectures remotely now from New Zealand. So um, hopefully it's interesting. So so what did did uh, the the Unity do? Well, it, it used to have Unit, but as you see here, it said it deprecated it, and it says go and have a look at the blog post. And what the blog post does is it says, hey, look, we have we're getting rid of it. Um, we're doing a transition to something else. They don't really specify that, um, but it's a. There'll be a new matchmaking system and and multiplayer game server, right? So the new service will work seamlessly with multiplayer game server hosting. So this was the key thing when it said, um, basically the unity engine itself was not going to manage your matchmaking and your server hosting it will work with a third party oh you had me for the professional program oh good um so uh so yeah so they basically cut it out in 20 in, in 2019 they had the unit slowly running out in 2020 so it's gone soon right so if you if you followed any of the old unity unit stuff they are removing all the support for it and it will disappear at the end of of next year right all of the stuff that they were doing right so here you can see they actually have and if i make that slightly larger um the peer-to-peer -peer relay service that was the one where i was saying that you know they they still had if you're going to do a peer-to-peer -peer game they had to have a relay service to be able to communicate between those peers so it was relaying the information and that one was costing them a lot because people would make peer-to-peer -peer games and Unity would still have to pay for the server to communicate, right? And and kind of the developer only paid during development and, you know, a real hassle. Uh, so they're getting rid of those. Now, the new components, so they have um, the transport layer and server runtime, so they're, they're, they were in alpha, they started releasing that. Um, game server hosting service from Multiplay. Third-party company, you go and pay for server hosting, right? So you're paying a cloud company to do the server hosting. Um, and Vvox is another separate third party that's gonna manage communication. So they've moved from it being Unity and embedded in the engine to, oh, here's an example third party um, server that you can pay for and your Unity will be able to work through that and will use their, their, their API but you're not going to get it from Unity anymore, right? So that's that was the transition. 
Um, and so now, when you go and look at Unity Networking, what you get is, uh, oh, that was the blog again. What you get is um, Multiplay, which is a third party, is a company that's selling you server time. Um, they have their um, launch without limits and how to deliver gaming. So um, multi-cloud scaling and quality of service and zero downtime and matchmaking. So so this this company um, is something you you can you can go and get prices right. So and kind of work out how much it's going to cost you to run my multiplayer service right. So they're, they're in the tell us about yourself. They won't tell you the price of things until you, that you tell them what you're trying to do, and then they'll tell you kind of how much it's going to cost, right? So at the moment, Unity Multiplayer is looking a bit more complex than Unreal Multiplayer, right? Um, but, you know, though, so, these, the, so, so there is still documentation around these services and what they'll look like in the Unity user, Unity services. So this moves out of core into Unity services, so networking becomes not a core feature, but a service that you pay for. Um, and you can see that it it uses so so when it talks about networking, it doesn't just talk about multiplayer, which is kind of that you know two players sending data back and forth, multiplayer sending data back and forth, hundreds of players sending data back and forth. But you actually see that it talks about ads, which is like ah. Oh, this is how using my networked game I can get networked ads into the game. So that's one of the uses of the network is not that it's a multiplayer game, single player game, but the networking is there to get advertising into your game. Right? So you don't just use networking for gameplay. Even Zero MQ, you could just use that for, you know, advertising messages, like, you know, buy Coke or something, right? Whatever the advertising message is, you could just send a message and you could have that pop up on, on your, your game. Your game now has networking because it needs to get the right ad, the current ad that's being paid for. And so that's what the ad services are doing in networking. There's also analytics, how people are playing your game, you send data about how it's being played. Not that it's multiplayer, just data of your single player game. Um, there's cloud building and cloud diagnostics, so you actually can use the server to do the building, so you don't have to do it on your own machine, and you use CPU that's in the cloud, and, and theoretically is cheaper than buying big servers yourself. And you can do cloud diagnostics, you can do collaborate networking, uh, and in that purchases, right? So there's a bunch of, of other services that are do with networking that aren't multiplayer services. Um, you also have, um, yeah, the, the analytics and game tuning and Unity ads, and so you can find out other the the other parts of networking within the multiplayer service, right? And so what what is able to be done, right? So this is yeah again setting up for services, uh, and when we look at Unity ads, it it takes you to the uh, how you monetize and how you add 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 ads um, to your game, right? So so you don't just think of networking as, oh, how do I make my game multiplayer? It's also a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do with the network once you've connected. Uh, and that, you know, that goes down to having a high score list, right? Because where do you keep your high score list? Well, that has to be on a server somewhere. How do you pay for the server? Well, you have to find a contract for someone who's going to host a service for you. You could set it up on Amazon Web Service, right? And you could set up a, a simple SQL database, um, which had a, a front end, and you'd send it a, um, you'd send it data, like the current score. It would store that in a table, and when you ask a high score list, it will give you out from that table a list of the names of pay, players' scores, and you can display it. But you're gonna have to have a server. That server's gonna have to accept incoming data, listen for requests, and send data. Okay. Once you're doing that, you're paying for some sort of service. Maybe you should pay for the whole game networking service rather than just hosting high score lists. Right? If you're on mobile or you're using Google Play, you can use Google Play services and like the Google Play um, services will store high, high score lists for you. Right? So it doesn't do the multiplayer stuff for you, but it is the server that will score your high score list. But 
there's a cost of you therefore sharing that data with Google and it's Google that is, is being the host and there are network calls that you can send where you just send the high score to the Google Play services. You have to sign an agreement, you have to have a token that identifies you as your game and so there's, there's some work to do there but you can connect to those sort of game services that give you some of this networking like and they can give you ads, they can give you high score lists, they can give you bonus achievements and um, badges and things so you can they have some things in their service that you can use from a networking that's not multiplayer perspective. Okay so John off topic but I'm curious if you know anything about New Zealand's stance on exchange students with the current COVID situation. Right, yes, exchange students. Um, I'm in discussing. Um, so normally, New Zealand takes in apparently about 120,000 students per year, right? Which is, you know, for 5 million people, 120,000 is quite a lot of international students. The government has told us they expect that to be around 6,000 this year. So only about 5% of what we would normally take in at the moment. However, that advice changes rapidly and constantly and any kind of virus or containment or new information could change that. But at this stage, they're only gonna take in a few, a few students and they haven't told us what they're gonna prioritize around those 6,000 students. Um, however, that could change, um, and it could change relatively rapidly. Uh, however, we do make our international students pay international fees, so it is relatively expensive, relatively expensive. You know, it's expensive to come and study as an exchange student to New Zealand. Unless, well, but you know, as a Norwegian, you can still get, I think Learner Castle will pay for some of that, so there is ways of, of paying for some of that. Um, it is a pretty safe country to be in if at the moment, um, given that we have basically no community. To, well, we had one today. Uh, we had zero for the two days before that of community transmission. So we're we're pretty much COVID free. Um, and so it looks like we're going to have a high demand on get people wanting to come and stay, like ride out the rest of the the pandemic in New Zealand. But at the moment we've got New Zealand citizens coming back and they're filling up all of our, because we, so when you come to New Zealand, you go and stay in a hotel for two weeks and the police and the military watch you for two weeks to make sure you don't interact with people, right? So that's that's what we're currently doing um, at our borders. Uh, and at the moment, we're just letting in New Zealand citizens and now we're just opening it up to their partners. So, and that's, Basically, we've filled up all of our hotels that we're using for that, uh, and our population has been growing because New Zealanders have been moving back to New Zealand, particularly now to ride out winter, uh, and so they have summer here in New Zealand with no COVID and you know nice weather, um, and avoid the winter spike in the northern hemisphere, which looks like the US and the UK are going to be devastated really badly for all of the northern hemisphere winter. So yeah, unfortunately, no, we're not letting a lot of exchange students in at the moment. Um, I am, however, just of interest to you game programs, because you're doing your, your bachelor, some of you are doing your bachelor at the moment. Um, I'm in the process of writing up a master's degree um, here in New Zealand, and in, in, in Wellington actually, um, on game development. Uh, and what we're looking at doing is potentially setting that up with an exchange with uh, Finnish and NTNU so that we can run summer, we can do an exchange program for the summer so that master students who are studying in Finland and Norway could take the one of the winter months or winter blocks out and come and spend, um, you know, eight weeks in New Zealand, four weeks holiday, four weeks um, studying and then go back to to, to Europe so um, see if we can cut out some of the winter and do an exchange here in New Zealand because um, you know I'd like to try and set that up at that master's level uh, so we might be able to, to to sort out something like that it won't be 2021 but the design is to try and make that for 2022 so um, <laughs> 
so yeah so you you might yeah so at the moment um we're looking at that uh and yeah maybe in a year's time it won't be so much about avoiding COVID at that time so hopefully all of us will have vaccines and it will be you know under control but then it will be about you know coming to the other side of the world having some fun um you know missing out on winter in norway um, so yeah so because this 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 winter is going to be scary i would say in the uk and the us um and actually bits of europe if you if if they don't get corona back under control um but you know that's yeah it's a it's a it's a weird world okay so um do we have any on topic networking questions Okay, so I can put this one across and put it into done. <laughs> Sorry, COVID talk during that week. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was a little bit out of context. It was a little bit in context, mostly out of context. So that's why I'm trying to bring it back to let's talk about networking. Do we have questions about networking rather than COVID? Um, it's just you're asking about, like, yeah, how do you, how do you get out here? So I was thinking of putting... Um, shaders and gpu programming as for the next week's lecture are you guys happy with that if we go and have a look at the list um let's see how the voting's going so we've done 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 and that was the next on the list with five of you voting that one up um i haven't seen you add a topic yet you guys are entitled to add topics um to uh, to the issues particularly the lectures and then i will I will spend more time on that and give you a lecture on those topics. Uh, so those are so we had data management daily. You know, if you don't, I will add some more topics to discuss. But as I said, for next week, what I'd like to do is organise through the week, probably Tuesday and Wednesday is easiest for me next week, um, to do some morning meetings with you and um, get an update on how your projects are moving. Um, I'm also going to start moving this lecture because at the moment it's 10 till midnight as of sunday we do our summertime right so we're moving our clocks by an hour and then a couple of weeks later you guys move your clocks by an hour and so this lecture goes from being 10 till midnight here in new zealand to being midnight to 2 a.m that's too hard for me i'm not going to do that so i'm going to move you guys forward two hours and we'll start doing this from 10 till 12 on a Friday rather than from 12 till 2 on a Friday, right? So we'll move earlier in the day on a Friday to keep me being able to do it without falling asleep. Um, but yeah, so if, if, if that still ranks as the, the next topic on the list, we can go to the boards and I've put that topic across and into the to-do. Okay. Is there anything else you wanna you wanna chat about? Any other questions you have about networking? Um, I mean, if you're interested in the in that the the discussion on how Halo did its networking, so if you look at at um, Halo two networking, um, so the interview with Chris Butcher. Um, so Chris is a New Zealander. He went through university with me. Um, actually a friend of mine so he was the lead on the Halo 2 networking so um, I've also chatted to him about this whole thing and so this is quite a good interview where he talks around how they managed the networking in Halo 2 and how to get it to run transatlantic because that was the big problem they had is how do you get the Americans to talk to the British because that was their their big um, their, their big challenge um, and so they go through and they, he, he talks about the the new networking model that they used and how they they kind of built that transatlantic networking model um and it's getting priorities and and so yeah so that's that's a really nice article where he kind of explains what what they did and how they did it okay so um, if you're interested that's a really good article um and if you want any further questions i can always ping him and and say hey chris I, my students have, have are concerned. Um, so.
So um, you mentioned Amazon Web Services and networking host. Um, do they have other providers that um, being popular? Um, so I all of the all of the cloud services can run as 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 hosts so azure of course runs in and amazon web services is pretty standard amazon actually makes a lot of money from their web services um and microsoft has been doing a big push on azure so it you can run stuff there um there's the google cloud you can run stuff there i those are naked cloud services so you have to decide what you're going to build and you have to build your own server on top of it so actually what people usually do is they they are um so there is a bit more of a moving to bespoke as in a game hosting servers that will host your game server so that you can connect uh, or just a matchmaking service and the peer-to-peer -peer routing service and you pay for the traffic that goes through them um so multiplayer is one uh photon was being used as a networking communication um multiplayer stuff uh as another company yeah um honestly you you have to go and check um because they keep updating and changing um do you know how steam remote play and steam generally help um, helps games with networking so so with networking so steam um you have uh while you're just developing right and you're using um unreal you and you can use steam um and you get a debugging identity right um and you communicate through the debugging identity now everyone in the world every all the developers in the world are using that well all the the unregistered developer in the world are using the same identity, which can slow it down and it becomes a bit of a hassle and you can sometimes lose packets. Um, when you register and get your game approved through Steam, they have that those services for basically doing that matchmaking and, and dealing with communication and dealing with being a, a, a hosting site that knows the machines that are connecting and and does some of the digital rights management and those sort of things so it it so the steam interface does actually allow you to do networking uh, while you're in, in dev mode you're using the, the same key as everyone else so it's it's a bit flaky and you wouldn't really want to release it with that so if you want to release and you've done your networking through steam you do need to release on steam and you need to become a registered um company with them and be releasing through them and get green light and all of those things right so and you know it, it's okay it's great to show off that your skills but if you're going to actually release a multiplayer game you have to work out how you're going to do that matchmaking and how you're going to pay for those servers and if if you're going to release through stream you do it because you're actually taking a cut of your sales um but if you're going to do it kind of independently then you you need to kind of have that separately yeah, that was that was my dad <laughs> just wandering past okay um azure yeah microsoft azure is is perfectly reasonable um they're all, they all change what they the, how they do their business models and how they pay for things so yeah um you just need to check at the time okay are there any other questions well, you've got me on the hook. Well, if there aren't, I shall end my recording. I will um, remux that to, to MP4, uh, and I'll update it to the um, uh, un published no um what's the term that youtube use so we, i'll upload it to the youtube channel um you've got the slides already linked there um in terms of the halo stuff and that other stuff um and the unity stuff just google the unity network and you'll see the same resources um it is a third party you, you'd have to look at paying for it um that's just the new way they're doing it 
and um, you can Google the Halo 2 stuff and read that. It's, it actually really is an interesting read if you're trying, wanting to understand how networking works in a, in a game. Um, right, so which university? So I used to work at Otago University in Dunedin, and I'm currently working at Victoria University in Wellington. Um, both are perfectly reasonable universities. Um, Wellington is a capital city. It's a bit more of an artsy culture and a bit, it's a bit bigger. Dunedin is, is a pretty city, but it is kind of right. It, as I say, it's the furthest PhD from Europe. The furthest you can get from Norway and still get a PhD, right? So it's kind of the university furthest away. Um, so, you know, eh, that could be a good thing. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm currently working at, at Vic, Victoria University of Wellington. Wellington being the capital city. So, right. Okay, well, you guys have a, a, a good weekend. Um, and I will see you next week. I'll organize, I'll send out some requests on um, uh, meetings so that I can chat with you guys about how your project's coming along. Cool. Okay. See you next week.